Okay. So we've been looking very briefly at Psalms. I'm hoping to do a bit more on Psalms. And what I said I would do with that is I would go through some stuff from Walter Brueggemann as our kind of key influence and uh, uh, thinker when it comes to the Psalms. Uh, he's an incredible theologian, very well respected. He's, I think he's 90 or something. Like he's properly old. He's properly old, but still going strong. And the older he gets, I think the more confident he is in the voice that he has and in sharing the voice that he sees that is dominant throughout the narrative of the scriptures. And I think that that voice has become uh, what we would say more progressive as time has gone on, as he's realized that his picture of God is one that is more inclusive and accepting and generous. And um, I really love that. Uh, so I love the way that, that he teaches the Psalms, but he's been teaching the Psalms for literally as long as any of us have been alive. Like, so he's, he's uh, pretty old school when it comes to this stuff. So I'm going to start with a quote, uh, several quotes actually from, from Walter Brueggemann. The Psalms, with a few exceptions, are not the voice of God addressing us. They are rather the voice of our own common humanity, gathered over a long period of time, but a voice that continues to have amazing authenticity and contemporaneity. It speaks about life the way it really is. For in those deeply human dimensions, the same issues and possibilities persist. And so, when we turn to the Psalms, it means we enter into the midst of that voice of humanity and decide to take our stand with that voice. We are prepared to speak among them and with them and for them to express our solidarity in this anguished, joyous human pilgrimage. We add a voice to the common elation, shared grief and communal rage that besets us all. This is from his uh, book, Praying the Psalms. Uh, a little bit later in that Chapter He says, I suggest in, simp in a simple schematic fashion that our life of faith consists in moving with God in terms of A, being securely oriented, B, being painfully oriented, and C, being surprisingly reoriented. Each of these moments is kind of like a life cycle and we go through this, these three steps. I think we go through them again and again and again as we pursue our way to some kind of maturity. So when we consider this model of being oriented, which is to say everything is good. God is in the right place. I am in the right place. He is sovereign. I am here. Or when we see that things are disorientated and we kind of, I think in that we take on the, the opposite voice and we say everything is not good. Where is God? He is not in his right place. When things are broken, when things are full of grief or challenge or even trauma. Or then there is that surprising rediscovery of knowing that God's providence and grace and, and, um, and you know, all, all knowing, all powerful oversight is still there. So when we think about being oriented and disoriented and reoriented, when we look at our lives right now, where would we put ourselves? I think for most um, middle-class Western Christians, we would say we're pretty well oriented. There are things in our life that go wrong. There are health issues. There are relational problems. But largely, we don't have any significant calamities that face us. But if we look more broadly than just ourselves, if we read the paper, if we look at what's happening in Ukraine or in Gaza or in other places in the world, we very quickly realize that there is a collective voice of society that is disoriented in places right now. And for some people, they choose to join their voice with that disorientation, to cry out to God on behalf and with those people. Maybe there is a surprising reorientation that's happening somewhere you can see it happening in the world or in your own life. Uh, Brueggemann, when he reflects on this, he says that that middle class uh, church, he says they're pretty much always in the first category. They are well oriented. They have the resource, the luxury, the opportunity. They, even when things are wrong, there is a way to fix it. They are well-oriented. And he thinks that because of that, the church by and large in the West does not make very good prayers and they don't make powerful worship songs. Because they're so well-oriented, they just don't have the fuel to stoke the fire of true prayer and true worship. 
This orientation is uh, reflected in the kind of predictable wisdom or the even cliche wisdom, if I go so far, of the Proverbs. In the Proverbs, the, the righteous get what is good and God blesses them and the unrighteous and the foolish, they get what they deserve. Everything is in order. But anyone who has been around for more than five minutes would know that that order doesn't always work. The righteous don't always prosper and the wicked don't always get their comeuppance. Seems like a bit of a ripoff. Nonetheless, the Psalms of Orientation, which is my topic for today as we work through these, uh, these ideas, help us to feel a sense of gratitude for the orderly life that we live. They are a life that is lived that is in line with our values and with our principles. It's when everything adds up. But uh, as we'll discover in, in future weeks when we talk about it, it's in that disorientation and reorientation space that the most poignant prayer and worship is really expressed. So Brueggemann makes six uh, distinctive theological conclusions about Psalms of Orientation. So I want to quickly look at those six distinctive conclusions. And he would characterize the first three of them as being largely positive and the other three as being somewhat negative. Uh, but we'll cover that in a second. The first one is uh, of his points is simply the Psalms of Orientation celebrate the life-giving capacity of God's creation. So this morning, Jared read from Psalm 104, and it talks about God's creation, how he places the pillars of the earth. He is in control from the very beginning. He is God, the creator. The Psalms of Orientation tell us about God's life-giving capacity. They are uh, stories of creation and, and God's Greatness. The Psalms of Orientation, this is point number two, not only celebrate the order of the world, but they also serve to maintain it. So this is a, a, a bit more complicated kind of point. When we pray through the Psalms, when we engage with the narrative and story and theology of the Psalms, it's a liturgical performance that contributes to our sense of belonging and an affirmation of God's control over the world. So the Psalms of Orientation establish that God is in control, that he created, but the Psalms of Orientation also say we recognize that. And so in our own life, we create that reality that God is in control. They are a liturgical performance of sorts that creates the world around us. It shapes our perception of the world. When we pray through God, you are creator, we see the world as though God is creator. And the corporate experience of doing that is that it creates for us um, a life uh, with God as the foundation. When we worship together and we sing those songs, so today we sung a song, Leaning Into You, uh, which is, um, who wrote that song, CJ? The Red Hill Guys, wasn't it? Yeah. Emily Minto wrote that song. And it's largely a psalm of orientation about how God is there and safe and in control and he created when we do that, we are firmly creating a world that says God is our foundation. Point number three, the Psalms of Orientation express a conviction that human actions have moral significance. Human actions have moral significance. Think about those Psalms, the, the, uh, sorry, the Proverbs as well. The righteous get prosperity and the wicked get judgment and justice. There is a sense of the rightness in those. So the Psalms of Orientation express a conviction that human actions have moral significance. They convey the idea that the world is a morally coherent place and that actions have corresponding consequences. You reap what you sow. Your actions have moral implications for you, but not just for you. Your actions have moral implications for your family and your community and for the world around you. When we live in an immoral way, it breaks the relationships in the world around us. And when we live in a moral way, then it builds the kingdom of God around us. There are relational and um, um, relational implications and theological implications and also just practical implications for us and our family and community when we are living out um, the Psalms of Orientation. Walter Brueggemann says, In popular piety, Without people even thinking about it, the only psalms people know are the psalms of orientation. 
It's important to keep the rest of the repertoire working that allows for faith in disorientation. The Psalms of orientation are enormously valuable resources for us, but they are by themselves not adequate because they do not allow for the slippages of disorientation that are inescapable in the living of one's life. So, so far we've seen um, these first three points about the Psalms of orientation. But they're not complete without the rest of the Scripture. And so when we treat them as though they are the complete corpus of the Psalms, when we only memorize those Psalms, when we only recite those Psalms, when we only live in those Psalms, when our worship songs are only shaped by those Psalms, we don't leave room for disorientation. We don't leave room for distress. We don't leave room for not meeting the mark. So there are a few other things that um, points that Walter Brueggemann makes, and I think these are largely in reaction or a commentary on the misuse of Psalms of Orientation. Because when we exclusively memorize, recite, and proclaim these Psalms, we tend towards controlling other people and trying to induce guilt and denial. So... Here are his three not-so-great points about the Psalms of Orientation. The first is that they function as a, as a form of social control. They leverage people to do what we want. They contribute to an ethical formation and reinforce societal norms and expectations. Now, this isn't like with my own children. This is the world that I try to paint for them. If you do good, you will be blessed. And if you do bad, you will be Punished. Uh, you'll face consequences. You'll have real world um, problems in your life if you do wrong. So it's a simple moral worldview that we present, but it's not. The cause and effect of the Psalms of Orientation don't really add up in real life. When you are good, it doesn't stop you from getting sick. It doesn't stop you from having tragedy or trauma or financial problem. It is a, a bit silly to suggest that if you are simply just a good person, that you will never have a problem paying your mortgage. There are plenty of good people who run into financial ruin. So the Psalms of Orientation kind of control people and they say, we want you to live good and not bad. It's a bit simplistic. Number five, the Psalms of Orientation can induce feelings of guilt. They kind of suggest that if something isn't right in your life, it must be because you did something wrong. So if our formula is created by the Psalms of Orientation and good behavior leads to blessing and bad behavior leads to disaster and we face disaster, maybe it was our fault. Maybe it was a personal failure. Maybe because of this thing that happened in my life, I, I've got this illness or I have this chronic disease or I've lost a pregnancy or maybe it was because I did something wrong. We very quickly fall into guilt and blame and, and introspection that is unhelpful when we model our world exclusively on Psalms of Orientation. I know this in my own life. There have been tragedies in my own life and you immediately pull out a microscope and say, did I make this happen? Am I somehow responsible for this? So when you are in the deepest pit of despair or grief or struggle or challenge, when you are in the, the, the valley of darkness and death, all of a sudden you start saying, I led myself here and it's my fault. What an awful place to be. Instead of finding comfort in the Psalms, we flick to those Psalms that are well known and we find condemnation. The regular confession of sin that is a kind of a fixation of religious people and the assurance of pardon uh, that we have from liturgical practices reinforce this sense of guilt. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't experience guilt in a healthy way, as a trigger to say we've violated our, um, our values or had our values violated and we need to repent and turn back towards righteous living. But when we face disaster, we shouldn't immediately think it was my fault. Sometimes life is just rubbish. And finally, the Psalms of Orientation can promote denial by encouraging individuals to maintain the illusion that everything is working even when it's not. The Psalms of Orientation encourage us to praise God when we are sick, because that's the right thing to do, instead of saying to God, I hate being sick. The Psalms of Orientation tell us just to praise and be in denial of all that is wrong in the world. 
When we just sing praise songs to God and we ignore what's happening in the war-torn countries, when we ignore what's happening from the, the rich treading on the poor, the injustices at the city gates, when we just pray orientation and we don't allow ourselves to be stirred into action, we live in denial. The denial uh, can be a personal context or it can be a social, broader context where we refuse to acknowledge the genuine problems in our life and in our world. So the Psalms of Orientation in isolation are not enough. They are beautiful and they make um, beautiful songs, but as Walter Brueggemann would say, they don't make interesting songs. He would suggest that they're quite boring. In fact, he even talks about the language of the Psalms. He says that the language of the Psalms in the Psalms of Orientation is very simple Hebrew. There's not a very broad vocabulary. But when you get to the Psalms of disorientation and reorientation, when you get to the imprecatory Psalms, the cursing and the trauma and the anger, all of a sudden the language just blossoms. There is so much more depth and character. And it's, it's like all the writers of the Psalms pulled out their thesauruses when they were getting cranky in a way that they didn't when they were happy. The Psalms of Orientation celebrate God's life-giving capacity. They celebrate God's creation. They celebrate the, the world, but they also help us to create that order in our own lives. They establish and we, we breathe into life, prophetically declare through the liturgical practice of praying the Psalms that God is creator and God is in control. The Psalms of Orientation express a conviction that there is moral consequence to our actions. What we do matters. But we also need to be careful that we don't lean too heavily into them and just use them as a way to control people and manipulate people and encourage guilt and denial. So I just want to quickly, let's start at the beginning. I'm not going to do every Psalm. 150 Psalms would take a long time. But let's start at the beginning. Psalm number one is a Psalm of Orientation. So the Psalms, when they were compiled, they were written over hundreds of years and then eventually um, probably a committee got together and said, let's make our prayer book. And they started with Psalm number one. There was probably a very long and tedious committee meeting about this. But it's very simple. It's, it introduces the way that we should live in order to prosper. It is the kind of the model for a Psalm of orientation. So Psalm chapter one. Blessed, this word blessed, uh, think of it more like happy, lucky, is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers. This is a, like a threefold stepping here. There is a progression of intensity. The person is blessed because they, they don't walk with people who are wicked. Not just that though, they don't even stand on the same road as the people who are headed towards wickedness. If there is, and Jesus talks about a narrow path and a, uh, and a narrow gate and a wide gate, if there is a road, a wide road to destruction, blessed and lucky and happy is the one who doesn't even stand on the road the sinners take. Blessed is the one who doesn't sit in the council of the mockers, the people who scoff at God. Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. The word law here in the Hebrew is Torah. And when they said Torah here, it's likely that they had in mind the book of Deuteronomy in particular. At least that's the, the view of Brueggemann. Um, perhaps also uh, the book of Leviticus. It's interesting because Leviticus is largely about purity. It's about how to live well. So when you think about the kind of uptight, uh, I dare say to politicize it, right-wing um, kind of evangelicals that it's all about the law, it's all about following the rules, they clearly uh, got as far as Leviticus and said, this is the book for us. But then if you, if you get into Deuteronomy, you realize that it's all about the widows, the orphans, the poor, the foreigner, the alien, the sojourner. It's all about caring. It's all about justice. And so the, the kind of the left-leaning, that's us mob, we kind of got stuck in Deuteronomy on, yes, God's justice is where it's at. Caring for the least, caring uh, for those who have no voice, giving a damn about the things that God gives a damn about, but not purity. 
That's the, the, um, the unfair archetypes there. But the one who is blessed, the one who is happy, the one who is lucky is the one who delights in God's righteousness and purity, but also in God's heart to care and for justice and the poor. The one who meditates on God's righteousness and his heart for the poor, his heart for justice. That's how you find true happiness. So you see, this is a psalm of orientation. It's saying this is what the world should be like. The people who care about God's righteousness and God's justice will be blessed and happy and lucky. That person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers, but not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. You see, this is the perfect order. You do what God wants. You care about what God cares about. You meditate. Instead of being obsessed and addicted to your telephone, you're obsessed and addicted with God's justice and righteousness. That's how you find true joy and happiness. Unlike the wicked, don't even stand on the same road as them. Don't go the same direction as them. Now it is, it's naive and it's simplistic, but it's beautiful. So it's like the beginning of the psalm says, here is where we start. This is beautiful. It reflects the wisdom that we teach our children. It's a model of the good getting rewarded and the bad getting punished. It shows us how we can live without turmoil, without any kind of difficulty. To delight in the law, I feel like to explain this, it's kind of like when you get in your car and you punch into Google and it gives you your your directions to get somewhere. Delighting in the Torah, God's law, his righteousness on one side and his absolute grace and mercy for everyone on the other side. They kind of keep us in. But no one says when they get in the car and they're following that map to get to their destination, geez, this GPS is very restrictive. I would love to go the wrong direction right now. And so God's law is not about restricting our behavior and making us miserable. It's about getting us to where we need to go. Not just on time, but in one, in one place. In one, uh, in, in without breaking, without having an accident, without getting lost or running out of petrol. God's direction is good and it gets us to the right destination, his kingdom. So blessed to you if you stay on the path to his kingdom. Blessed to you if you are uh, dictating your ways by his law and by his justice. They lead to streams of water and prosperity. Consider this Psalm 1 in in light of Jesus' teaching where he uses some very similar language in Matthew 7. So he's at his Sermon on the Mount and he says, Enter through the narrow gate for the wide gate is broad and the road that leads uh, to it is to destruction and broad is the road that leads to destruction and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. If we follow the crowd, if we stand on the same road as the wicked, if we listen to their counsel, we enter through the gate of destruction. And it's not that is a wide road because it's it's easy. There are lots of ways to avoid doing God's thing. But the narrow gate, when you follow the law, it's easy to go the right way. When I punch in the directions in Google, it's not like it's harder to go the right way. It tells me exactly where to go. The narrow path may be narrow, but it is actually the easy path if you follow. If we love God's justice and follow his path, we find the gate to life. Heavenly Father, I thank you that that here in this room, in this place right now, we live in a relative peace that is unknown practically in all of history. I pray that we wouldn't stop, though, with the Psalms of Orientation, that we would sing the praises of your great mercy and your great power, but we would also lend our voice 
to the voice of the oppressed and the afflicted, those who face injustice. We would lend our voice to their, uh, to their plea and their cries, that we would enter into their narrative through the other Psalms, knowing that we are safe to bring our petition and our frustration and our anger and our angst and our hurt and our trauma and our everything to you. I pray that we would lean into those narratives so that we can uh, be in solidarity with those who right now uh, require your intervention. May we pray the whole Psalms. May we love your law, your righteousness and your justice. And may you lead us to streams, cool streams, green pastures. In Jesus' name. Amen.